Okay, thank you so much for this presentation, which was the first, uh, I think, at the CSA TPR uh, workshop about heritage, which really we have like most mainly your problematic topic and not very much nice houses or things like this. So I suggest that we open the discussion. So we will take three, four, maybe five questions, depending on how different they are. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving us the description of Chandanagar. Uh, I visited the city in 1964 or 5. So I may be 10 years old. So, you know, the Pondicherry I have visited also. Now, whatever you have said, uh, you have made a very, you know, uh, uh, good uh, description of the work you have done. But uh, when I visit, Puducherry now, it is called Puducherry, I suppose. So uh, there is uh, a fascination of French food, and there is music, traditional culture. So the culture will come when music, food, enjoyment, and we come to there, you know, something uh, about that. But the Chandanagar doesn't have any of them. So uh, you have not talked about any of the three if that has been incalculated by any NGOs in that way, I suppose, uh, and in Puducherry they have made, uh, uh, and uh, um, they have made uh, uh, some sort of a temple also, which depicts the Mother Earth, something like that. But on the other hand, uh, Chandanagar doesn't have any sort of, uh, you know, confluence of Indian or European cultures, a totality of uh, some sort of a monument uh, which can draw people to that city. So if you are doing, uh, you know, if you have a subject for uh, seven years, I suppose, uh, you started in 210 and now it is 217. So if any of these things uh, still there, uh, even the French Academy for Football, I'm just giving an example. So the uh, city can galvanize to some extent. I think uh, the point here is that... Uh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I, found, I found it very interesting, the, point, uh, the point that you illustrated about uh, how existing the existing ancient monuments act and the uh, regime under that only looks at monuments and does not look... I mean, the the law itself is called the Ancient Monuments Act, right? so it doesn't recognize things beyond monuments. Uh, and on the other hand, you have uh, uh, perhaps, uh, to take an example, the UNESCO World Heritage Understanding, right? So the, the sites in India extend much beyond monuments. So you have natural heritage, and then you have things like the mountain railways, which are actually active living things. Um, so how do you think uh, from a policy or institutional framework uh, one moves beyond the idea of a monument and that uh, creating those circles of inf uh, whatever protection around it? Because I think that's a very important point that you made about uh, the space being a living space as opposed to just creating this protected monument which then isolates it from the community and then the monument remains but the heritage dies. So you mentioned that West Bengal is the only state which uh, has a state legislation for protecting urban heritage. Uh, I am curious whether is there a way in which you can recommend to include certain legislations wherein you can provide incentives to these owners to protect their heritage. Normally we have that for listed heritage buildings in Mumbai, Ahmedabad and Hyderabad wherever these listings are done. But uh, since they have a separate legislation for protecting urban heritage and precincts already in place, I wonder if a recommendation can be made to include such kind of incentives and regulations in that, for the owners especially. Okay. So, uh, 
uh, as far as uh, the tourism potential of of chandanagar goes there are no monuments but there are uh, places of interest definitely so like i was saying about the nationalist movement there are places uh, there are the house of motilal roy as well as the prabhatak sang where all the nationalist movement happened where aurobindo ghosh actually hid uh, for two weeks before going to pondicherry which are of local interest which do exist as far as uh, the french restaurants and all because of this entire uh, like you have uh, i feel that it was also because chandanagar merged with west bengal and didn't stay with the other three other four uh, french sort of colonies that its culture was a little different they try, they destroyed almost everything like the french restaurants and everything was gone in the first wave of uh, of nationalism so it does remain in the way of their lives it remains in their memories and in some of their houses but if you uh, look on the street uh, there's you'll have to really look to uh, the architecture is definitely a mix of indian and french uh, uh, it, it, it's it's a confluence it, you can't say it's completely indian and you can't say it's completely having said that i think uh, there is uh, there are many people who are working on things like music but they are not based in chandanagar they are based in calcutta or they are based abroad there are multiple initiatives that are happening parallelly on different aspects so some people are working on uh, there there used to be this dhoti that was no i make one intervention when you have made an effort so the culture will come only from the uh, the fusion of the music and the food if you would have to do certain you know uh, sort of a rejuvenation or a galvanizing work definitely these are the important aspect of the culture for the fusion of the two so that you can attract the people from both the communities and then the uh, french uh, people have to make an extra effort to go there and uh, yeah. those who are the foundations in the french uh, you know arena they have to uh, take an initiative along with you i'm just making a hypothetical uh, because uh, even if you have another one to two years so these things are essential for the people to be drawn to your uh, you know if you have a, a free uh, french subject being uh, uh, taught there so yeah. that is not your uh, uh, that has to be done by some french uh, you know foundation or the I ngo that, something like that yeah so we are uh, what i presented was uh, what i have been doing as an architect but uh, the uh, there are other organizations that, like the alliance is trying to set up a, a, a center in chandanagar and there are and the chandanagar college is trying to do an exchange with another college in france so all of those things are happening i didn't touch upon them because i was actually talking from my domain of urban heritage conservation and uh, as far as uh, your question about uh, world heritage sites is concerned is uh, uh, of course we are all trying to uh, you know understand for for uh it's it's we are recognizing that this monument and urban heritage needs a se separate sort of legislation now uh, as i'll i'll answer her question first about economic incentives they have been working the west bengal heritage commission has been trying to look at what other models are existing in the country they tried to adopt the tdr system and it apparently failed so uh, they are uh, i think trying to work within their system of how they can better this act to give incentives to uh, uh, like they they have been looking at what rajasthan has been doing with um, you know tax incentives for people who do home stays and things like that so i think there are uh, you know circles in motion it takes a lot of time to move things but i think they, they are open to you know these kind of an ideas what we are trying to also say is uh, apart from waiting for the government to do is there something that people can do on their own is there are there can economic incentives be created for people to you know uh, entrepreneurship and these sort of things that can they happen i think that's what the focus of the workshop that is going to happen in january is going to be along with i am looking at what are the options that people already have and how they can monetize that like for example right now there are no good places to stay so if somebody is going to volunteer you know like a, a room in their house or put it on airbnb or something like that just to you know small things that start helping them uh, become economically sustainable in the long run so we are just trying to collect people and uh, get them thinking because i think every sometimes all you need is a trigger for other things to sort of happened and uh, looking at at world heritage sites uh, we are still figuring out in india how to deal with these large scale 
city level uh, things in itself. In fact, I've been part of the UNESCO team on the Darjeeling Himalayan Railway and it has been quite a, a lot of uh, discussion that has been going on about what is the heritage, is it the train, is it the track, is it the uh, view from the train that we, you know, we are discussing and if it is the view from the train, then are we going to just blanketly protect all of uh, the hills that that the train goes up to or are we trying to regulate the development so uh, so and what are our legal instruments because all said and done we have to work within the legal instruments that we have uh, at our hand now we are very lucky that in the case of the west bengal heritage commission which is applicable in the case of chandanagar as well as in the case of darjeeling there is a potential of listing precincts and that helps you regulate development doesn't say no development like the archaeology but says regulated development of course we don't have a detailed system in place yet of how we are going to do it but uh, i would like to say that at least there exists a system how we make best use of the system and how we make it uh, work to the best potential is something that we is really our job as you know consultants trying to make it work also do any of these mechanisms have a do any of these mechanisms have any scope for consultation and participation of the local community because w one sense is that the ASI under the Ancient Monuments Act is this very top-down kind of thing which doesn't engage with the community at all, right? And to the point where like com communities have been displaced from the area surrounding monuments in the name of conservation, etc. So now what we are trying to also do is uh, with the Darjeeling Himalayan Railway put it as part of the planning process. Now the pa planning has a participatory sort of outcome and world heritage sites have to also adopt that. So whatever we, we may do with the Darjeeling Himalayan Railway, so to say, in the buffer zone, we'll have to go through the planning pro process, even though uh, it may be listed as a precinct. So how we tie the, uh, you know, disciplines of architecture and his heritage, landscape, urban development, and planning together is what we are trying to work on and hopefully by the end of next year we would have a system in place for Darjeeling which uh, is the main project that is going on under the UNESCO banner and that may set a precedent for the rest of West Bengal to follow. Um, about this protection business. Um, I mean, you know it, uh, but I'm just here in case it's not clear. You know, monuments are the prerogative of the archaeological survey, but these things are called heritage buildings, and it's very difficult to get people to remember to call them that because it's a completely different thing from monuments. Now, if any of these buildings are more than 100 years old, technically the ASI can take it over. For instance, the institute in Shimla has been taken over by the ASI. Hmm? But they really find it very difficult to cope with that sort of thing because they, for various reasons. But the heritage buildings which are listed, and apart from Chandranagar, there's more than 160 places of which listings have been done by INTAC. They're all there. And it's quite a precious list because these were done by volunteers over time. Now, these have, should all be given to the local municipalities and they have to notify it. Only then does it have any kind of uh, substance to it. Otherwise, they're just a, a lot of notes in a uh, register. So this is a very sad state of affairs that very few people, except the Bombay area and Maharashtra and Hyderabad and some others, have taken it on board. For instance, in Delhi, we submitted the list in the year 2000. Until 2010, it was not notified. And it was only because there was one gentleman, who shall remain unnamed, who wanted to demolish a particular building. So he got the municipality to notify the rest and demolished his own the next day, you see. So <laughs> it's a, a very tricky business. And secondly, the rules about these buildings also uh, the ASI is under the Department of Culture, but uh, heritage buildings are under the Department of Urban uh, Government, Ministry of Urban Development, who the word development is what is up, uh, most important for them, and they actually control the Delhi Heritage Commission. It's appointed from them. It's a scandal, I think, because they have absolutely no interest or kind of feeling for heritage, but it is under them. So you can think about this, about the 
peculiar kind of dichotomy out here and see what that holds. And um, as for this about communities, in the world heritage things, as far as I know, the one site that really upsets me is Sundarbans, where the, all the things given as, as, as attractive about the Sundarbans are the tiger and the mangrove forests. There's nothing about the people who live there. <laughs> Uh, you'd think it was unpopulated. Yeah. Thank you. Like, uh, first we will take the question and then we can open a little more the discussion about the subject. To, uh, do we have like some question about the presentation and what I've been presenting? so much heritage, especially in India, I'm talking India. I'm, now I'm, I have two countries to compare, and, and that will help us to draw parallels. As Canada, I've been there for a few months. Uh, over India, I've lived there and born here. You see the country, there's so much heritage. Is it humanly possible to conserve it? Have we so much funds? Have we so much management? Can we do it? Except only the state can do it. And, and I, and I I, I'm sure even state cannot do. There's so many neglect of the, the heritage, of the monuments, of the buildings, and the, the, the havelis and so on and so forth. You see in the old cities, cities all over the country. It's, it's not possible. It's a vast, vast place, vast place. That I'm in relation to what Chandranagar. The, the story is the same. Because it is not possible. Only state can do it. And even state cannot do it. They have the limitations. When state has the limitation, how can individuals do it? Because commerce has come into play. There's less and less space over here. In our country, there isn't much space left for us. Right? Whatever space we are trying to make use commercially viable, I mean, make more and more out of it. Single story, double story, 32 story, and 50 story, and so on and so forth. We are going vertical now. Now you want to preserve a single story or double story. It doesn't this go well with the with the people, with the, with the commercial attitude. Now, what can state offer to a, I'm the owner of a property, and there is a, the, 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 the person, the, the property agent, other the state agents, they come, and they have a lot of money to offer me, and the state gives me just a pretty small, small amount. This is a comparison over there. So, so what I mean to say is, and then funds and the management that goes in, you have taken over. See the management that goes into for the lifelong management. Where, where are the funds? So go the, 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 no, the, the, I, I, no, I said Canada. I said, uh, what I found is a lot of space, space, space. No man, you don't hardly see a man over there. No, they're looking for the monument. They're looking for some, something to come up that they can keep it for the heritage. That's a totally different scenario. Over here, we're looking for space. They're looking for the monument. Two diverse the, the situations over here. So in India, there is a problem, man. There is a problem. The, the, because we cannot manage, we cannot look. And only state can do it. Only state can do it. Thank you. So in, just in response, I have also uh, another question. For example, there are many cities that you pointed on the map. What happened in these other cities that were not French? <laughs> and did you discuss with this municipality? Did they receive any funds for heritage? And then I have another question. And for example, we say that in Noida people live, but there are no jobs. And uh, why in small town where, you, as you said, there is link with Calcutta, can we also promote heritage if there is no jobs anymore for people to stay? I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that it, there's been increasing consensus on the fact that heritage can now be used as a driver for sustainable development. In that context, do you think, I think connected to what a lot of people are asking, that is there a role for the private sector in that and how do you think that could happen? 
my question is a bit, uh, is, is not the same, but it's close to you. I mean, uh, this is a, a trade city you mentioned, so I guess diverse city will have different form of heritage. Of course, if you have ports and all that, this was uh, uh, state power. It was not trade. But in towns which had, uh, which were trade towns, other, uh, which didn't have this French influence, has there been any attempt, for instance, to reach to the diaspora? You mentioned the diaspora as uh, storytellers, but uh, one can imagine that some other towns, I'm thinking maybe especially in South Sydney, I think where there would be trade towns, are they, have there been these kind of efforts to reach to the diaspora as a you know, catalyzer from outside to maybe fund projects or fund heritage? Uh, uh, there's been uh, some projects with the Jew Do Jewish diaspora in Calcutta where some funds have been brought in for um, you know, at least documenting and preserving some of the synagogues. Uh, that is one diaspora that I am aware of. Uh, and uh, I think there was there's another project uh, which has been uh, happening in Murshidabad where uh, the Jain community in Rajasthan has been coming forward because uh, they have some sort of heritage uh, houses over there. Uh, as far as uh, uh, your question goes, I'm, I, uh, as I started my presentation, I said for, for us, conservation is not just about preserving and keeping everything as is. The whole con concept of conservation in the traditional concept was allowing change and making it relevant to us today. So even when we look at, uh, say, a, a Haveli in Shah Janabad, it doesn't have to be preserved as it is. It can be sensitively converted into a modern dwelling unit that has the, uh, that has, uh, the good things about heritage, but it's also a comfortable dwelling unit in the 21st century. So when we are looking at a place like Chandanagar, where there are multiple houses, uh, there is a possibility of um, of converting them, changing them, using design as a tool to make them relevant to the people uh, today. Having said that, I am also saying that uh, there are, uh, of course, I am saying that the people's hands are tied and that they, they, they love their heritage, but they don't have a choice, which is why they give it up to the developers. And there is a gap there. I am identifying it as a gap that needs to be addressed through some kind of a policy or uh, whatever. The state has tried it with TDR. It hasn't worked. But I am sure they are at it trying to find some kind of a solution of how you can balance heritage and uh, development. Uh, as far as the role of the private sector is concerned, uh, there there are many examples in, in Mumbai, for example, where there is uh, buildings which have been restored under uh, corporate social responsibility uh, and uh, they, they, uh, there are buildings which have been put to some sort of uh, commercial use like a bank or something like that where the funds have gone into the preservation of either the neighborhood or public spaces and stuff like that. That's how private sector comes into uh, conservation. In some projects, uh, there is even a PPP investment where you have like a BOT or a BOT model where they uh, actually look at like a fort and converting it into a hotel or something like that. Uh, so those kind of projects also do exist in our country. And when you asked about the other European settlements, so I'd like to uh, say that the Danish settlement at Serampur, the Danish diaspora did put in money. Uh, some donors gave the money to the National Museum of Denmark. And the National Museum of Denmark then uh, did an MOU with the state and uh, have restored three buildings in Serampur. One is a, a church, uh, one is the old government house, and now they're working on a, uh, the Danish Tevon. Uh, as far as uh, Chandanagar was concerned, the embassy was supporting the project on uh, on, on, on our project on documentation and malarization and bringing things together. Uh, in Chinsura, again, the Dutch uh, embassy was uh, instrumental in identification of the heritage, and they did a project on putting uh, signage in the town on uh, these heritage buildings, telling the people about uh, w what was important from the Dutch perspective. There is a Dutch uh, citizen who is based in Calcutta who has, based on that research, taken up cycle tours in the region. Uh, similarly, uh, lots of initiatives are happening in Calcutta. The West Bengal Tourism runs a ferry uh, through these towns. So the point is that different uh, sort of uh, things are happening. Collectively, they come together to form this Europe on the Ganges, but individual things have also happened. GLL has also prepared a master plan for tourism development in this entire region, I think uh, four or five years back. Thank you.
this is a commentary on your, you offer two definitions at the outset. One was a traditional one where you said monuments, that's what constitutes heritage. And the newer one, you said practically everything uh, traditional is heritage. And you seem to support this, uh, the second one, but in your actual uh, description of things, you lapsed into a support of the earlier, the more traditional definition of what is heritage, in that you focused on specific buildings and, of course, or a cluster of buildings. So, you know, the, the traditional one seems to be more accurate and in as much as it emphasizes beauty or attractiveness in an isolated building or in a cluster of buildings. So the second definition, which you actually said, you know, seems to be more accurate. You abandoned that and <laughs> saying that everything is heritage, but you did not actually accept that in your actual analysis, where you endorsed the first definition, that is the beauty and attractiveness. And that, you have to stress that point, the traditional one, because that also helps to resolve this conflict between development and preservation. I mean, no, nobody would argue that, say, the Taj Mahal should be demolished because of the character of the building. But some some parts of Shah Jahanabad can be because it's not sufficiently attractive. So, you know, this traditional definition, whether it's stress on attractiveness or beauty, whether, you know, that, that seems to be more accurate, even though you say that the, the, the contemporary one is more accurate. Uh, I'm, I was not trying to say either or. I think there's a place for both. But however, in uh, the discourse of urban heritage conservation, uh, I have uh, basically been talking about a journey that started with the traditional definition of identifying buildings for heritage value and how it has changed into bringing the community in and looking at how people view their heritage and what is important to them. So when we are looking at what we are going to do in January next year, we're talking about co creating for public spaces, we're talking about a way of life, we're talking about putting their oral history together. So I don't think I have abandoned that. Uh, but like I said, this is a uh, this is a project in progress and it has been for the last seven years and it will continue and it will evolve as concepts of conservation are constantly changing. Sorry, I have a follow-up question uh, to this because uh, what you mentioned is that you were very frustrated because uh, you were not able to put uh, so many buildings that you had uh, listed on their heritage. And uh, it was mentioned that in Delhi you had the same kind of struggle. It was very difficult, if not impossible, to get this. Uh, so one way is this way you, someone managed, has enough power to get uh, maybe buildings listed because of some other interest. But uh, do you see that this movement that you seem to have been generated from the ground, which is really people starting to uh, uh, reclaim their history uh, and uh, have been able to put some more pressure, and is this helping in listing these buildings, which is anyway seems to be the way to protect them in some, uh, and therefore from that buildings to bring this uh, public space uh, or this larger perspective on, on conservation. Because uh, if you if that doesn't lead to uh, really implementation, then uh, apart from collecting oral histories, you will not be able to preserve the the heritage. So uh, I think uh, what uh, one of the examples that I'd like to put over here is that uh, we had 99 buildings on the list. The first uh, for the list that the government has prepared has only picked up the public buildings. Now, in 2017, what I said in progress was that they have also picked up three living buildings and the owners have given consent for it. So one of the houses that this Rakshid Pavan, which is one of the old French houses, the family actually consented to being on the heritage list, where a lot of the other families said no. So I think even one step, uh, one drop in the ocean makes a difference. So if that one family consented, I think there there is a change of mindset that is is happening when they've consented that okay we want our ancestral house to be on that heritage list what what i also see happening is like some of these old merchant families they are letting out their premises like they let out their gardens for a party or something like that again knowing that it's a it's a noble mansion and people would want to pay to you know have a party there or they let out their thakur dalan for musical performances and things like that so i think there is a a, a bit of change where people are uh, you know they they know that there is 
there's a little value in their heritage and they can monetize in in whichever way they would want to that helps towards its maintenance in the long run I'm an archaeologist from the United States, and I've actually worked in a kind of equi equivalent situation, which was an Alsatian settlement in Texas. And similarly, we kind of united with a group from France that was interested in saving what was French about this Texas community. And um, I saw some danger in that situation because the, the city in Texas today is primarily Hispanic. So there was a privileging of this French history and saving the Frenchness of the community. And so um, what I found most interesting about your presentation is that you said um, how the community was most engaged was in your GIS website, where they were able to post about their own memories of different areas. And I was wondering if their memories were associated to the Frenchness or if they were more just personal memories of the history of the town in general? I think they were more personal memories and uh, they were, uh, when they were posting about incidents, the one uh, theme that was constantly coming across was the nationalist movement. So a lot mm. of people wanted to actually talk about uh, stories that were related to the nationalist movement. Mm. Then it, might, it will be interesting to see how you move forward because there might be some disconnect between what the community is able to profit from, which is potentially tour, tourist heritage mm -hmm. type of visitors, and the Frenchness of the community, and what the local people actually take pride in. So that's why we are trying to work on um, uh, with now co-creating and co-collaborating with them, because we are recognizing that it's not about Indian or French, but about this uh, identity that is a confluence of both cultures. So we're, uh, even if, if, if it was to be monetized, it would be this uh, mixture that would be monetized and not just a French or an Indian right. or a Bengali sort of aspect. Sounds exciting. Good luck. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a lot of questions have uh, given me a thought that uh, Chandanagar was a place where French and Britishers fought a very pitched battle. So why not to have a memorial of a sort uh, which has got certain, you know, uh, attraction towards uh, both the communities, the French and the Britishers coming together and uh, fight not fight again, but not to fight, <laughs> you know, but not to fight and uh, live in a peaceful manner because then uh, you have Puducherry where they have uh, made a very big temple and there are a lot of people going there from North India visiting that temple built by, you know, French and the uh, uh, Indian peoples there. And it's a very, it's in a huge uh, place and it's called a mother, you know, temple, something like that. So something, uh, you have to make an attractive so that, uh, you know, people can come. Uh, any church is there, French church, so that can be, you know, cultivated to see people come in. Anything which can uh, reflect the uh, culture of the French people in those times, because now the culture is also changing in every uh, nation. So th that was my point. Thank you. It's a museum. The French yeah. Institute is a museum yeah. that people do come to. It's protected by the Archaeological Survey of India. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, today it's
French um, moderator, all the Bengalis have left for the Durga Puja. <laughs> so, uh, that, thank you very much. It was extremely interesting. Thank you. It's my and pleasure. You've opened up a new uh, potential discussion in the CSHTPR Urban Workshop. So, thank you so much. Okay. Um, thank you. It was really interesting, I think. <laughs>